Hello, this is Dr. Scott Hoy. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Kyle and I are on break for the summer, but we've been selecting archived episodes that we find are relevant and interesting. So we hope you enjoy this encore episode of the podcast formerly known as the Chicago Psychology Podcast. mission took on more of a shape, and it's empowering the conversation about proactive suicide prevention through mental health outreach and education, um, meeting people where they're at, taking that common, thor- common theme and trying to make it um, a little bit more uh, tangible to the communities in the mental health spaces, inviting them to the table, letting them know that we're peer-led and we're clinically backed, so we're able to say the things that other people don't feel comfortable saying, can't say because they're worried about their license, uh, whatever, you know, so really cutting through the bullshit um, so that we could shatter stigma in the best way that we know how, and that's being loud and reminding people it's okay not to be okay, so that they can understand that uh, for themselves and stop fighting with it and carrying around these really unpleasant, uncomfortable feelings that can escalate into more serious things. Hello, this is Dr. Scott Hoy. On today's episode of the Chicago Psychology Podcast, Kyle and I sit down with Mike Vinopel, the Education Director of Hope for the Day. Hope for the Day is a Chicago-based nonprofit that works towards suicide prevention and mental health education and destigmatization. Mike invited us to the cozy environs of Sip of Hope, Hope for the Day's coffee bar. Mike fills us in on the origins of Hope for the Day and the Sip of Hope coffee bar. He also discusses the outreach and educational mission of the organization. At the same time, it is a candid interview and Mike shares his own mental health recovery story. Just a note to listeners, there is some language that could be construed as off-color, so you might want to listen when others who might be offended to this are not within earshot. And now, here's the interview. We're live at the Sip of Hope Cafe, which is a component uh, aspect of Hope for the Day. And we're sitting here with Mike Vinopal. Oh, that's close. Vinopal is Vinopal. how it's pronounced, but Vin- Vinopal is like pretty much what everyone says. Okay. Okay. They like they like the wine friend piece of it. Like, you know, pal, I like that. Vino. Vino. People call me Vino sometimes, too. So. So we're here with Other my... people that love opals happen to say it right Vino. on the first try. So. You know. All right. So, and Mike is the director of education for Hope for the Day, yeah. which is a nonprofit that works on suicide prevention and mental health education. Thanks for coming on board. Of course. Thanks for inviting me uh, yeah. and coming to the shop. Super Hope Coffee Bar is... Located in Logan Square, across from the community library, and uh, it's really special to us because it embodies the whole core of reminding people it's okay not to be okay and meeting them where they're at, not where we expect them to be, uh, as community members, to really do all we can do to uh, make it better. It's a special kind of outreach, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, maybe you can kind of introduce the audience to, since you're here, you can educate us and you can educate the audience. We'll just give you a platform to help us understand more about uh, Hope for the Day. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, at the very base of things, our organization was started in 2011 by one person. Uh, Johnny Boucher is the founder and CEO. He uh, was having a pretty su- successful run as a concert promoter uh, in his former life, and his boss and mentor completed suicide and it was like the ninth person in his life he was only 26 at the time right wow so instead of let that pain crush him like looking up to a hero that you think has everything and they've got the accolades and the success and the you know even like the money right to have them die in such a tragic way and to know that they were struggling in silence um could have crushed Johnny, but instead he took that as, I'm going to process this, I'm going to try and turn this negative into a positive, I'm going to start a nonprofit organization 
even though he was a concert promoter and didn't know the first thing about nonprofit. Um, but given that he was passionate about impacting the community, he leveraged the connections he had from concert promotion to talk to bands, talk to promoters, talk to venues, to meet people where they're at that way. Go speak from stage before a rock show, punk show, hip hop show, whatever. Make sure a lot of people, a lot of ears hear the message, hey, if you're struggling, that's okay. It's okay not to be okay. You're not alone. You're not crazy. You're not fucked up. Yeah. We're just trying to get through life. Uh, we got good days and bad days, and sometimes you need to talk about it. Um, so that created a crazy amount of momentum. Because then Johnny would post up at the back of those venues with resources um, that he had printed out and vetted himself to let people know that there are resources out there that you matter and... Uh, that it's okay to talk about it. Um, and th- that influence in the concert community or the entertainment community at large, um, there's a lot of people hurting. Uh, there's a lot of people looking to have some relief. And sometimes that comes in the way of a song or uh, a concert that you attend. Because you look around and people are singing the favorite lyrics that meant so much to you and you don't feel alone. Mag- magical music, right? Yeah. It can travel time. It could, it could transcend space. Uh, people cross the the world on the other side of the globe could be experiencing the same type of support from a song that you like you know that you got on your play- playlist for those bad days so yeah. that was a really good way to start a grassroots initiative um, and then he came to find that he needed to ask for some help in really bringing this nonprofit to the next level and he started bringing on people like Carl Evans our, our senior director of operations uh, and probably I would say credited as the author of our proactive prevention theory Um, and our mission took on more of a shape and it's empowering the conversation about proactive suicide prevention through mental health outreach and education Um, meeting people where they're at taking that common common theme and trying to make it um, a little bit more uh, tangible to the communities in the mental health spaces inviting them to the table letting them know that we're peer led and we're clinically backed, so we're able to say the things that other people don't feel comfortable saying, can't say because they're worried about their license, uh, whatever, you know? Yeah. So really cutting through the bullshit um, so that we could shatter stigma in the best way that we know how, and that's being allowed and reminding people it's okay not to be okay so that they can understand that uh, for themselves and stop fighting with it and carrying around these really unpleasant uncomfortable feelings that can escalate into more serious things addressing problems when they're small and being proactive like we are with other healthcare, um, rather than allowing things to reach a crisis stage in which you're exhibiting the highest risk behaviors and people that care about you can't help but notice what's right. going on right so keying people into the fact that mental health isn't just something that affects certain people with high risk factors but that we're human beings with brains And the last half a century, many people operated with a total absence of mental health education and understanding. So now we have a good 50, 60 years of scientific knowledge base, understanding that biological connection between thoughts, feelings, and emotions, the chemicals produced by our brain, and how things can be disrupted during development that you inherited or because of a situation that you were in or an experience that you had that can create and sustain a a lasting damage that we like to say are psychological injuries Uh, rather than trauma. Trauma, people get ideas about big T, little t, what's trauma, what's not, but ultimately we come from a place as community members that no one gets to tell you what's trauma for you. Um, You could be traumatized by a whole whole list of different things because we're all sensitive to different things to different degrees. And each of our own experiences up to this very moment are very unique and different that shape this. So um, with Carl being added to the mix, there was, there was a need for even more people and more so than just concert volunteers and outreach volunteers to man tables. So we began to grow by leaps and bounds. Now we have departments. I'm, I'm lucky enough to say that as a volunteer, I got to see this organization, organization add an executive director coming from Mental Health America, uh, okay. coming from a, you know, a very old, reputable, established nonprofit organization in the mental health space. Dave Kanicki, our executive director, 
Um, we had Ben Matson come over from Mental Health America, who was one of Dave's like uh, interns and knows a lot about impact and grants and stuff like that. And so, well, yeah. we got a bunch of wonderful people that have been added to the mix over the years to make sure that we're growing in the right ways, that our impact is expanding and being kind of strengthened by our community, you know, uh, really empowering that conversation for people to start the conversation for themselves first and foremost, yeah. uh, kind of reframe their understanding of their own mental health to be proactive with it. And then, you know, hopefully they feel comfortable then empowering other people to start the conversations for themselves rather than uh, being like, hey, I got it all figured out and making other people kind of feel stigmatized about not having it figured out. Yeah. Understanding we're all coming from different places is... Uh, is a super important part of what we're doing. But since we're in Sip of Hope Coffee Bar, you gotta, you gotta understand where that started. So we have amazing partners in the community that are either orgs like us, uh, nonprofits and such, or traditional businesses that are just doing amazing things, producing quality products, and uh, you know, being the talk of the town. We got people like Kuma's Corner, we got people like Live Nation, who does all the concert outreach with us and gives us great opportunities, summer, spring, fall, uh, and even in the winter times, right? Um, but Dark Matter Coffee probably is the exemplary partner of prevention like by which others have really tried to follow in that example. By that I mean, in the early days of Sip of Hope Coffee, there was no cafe, there was no community space. It was a bag of, a one pound bag of beans that was co-branded with Dark Matter Coffee and Hope for the Day. Uh, and it had messaging and resources right on the packaging. So when that happened, people were like, whoa, that's weird. Why would you put suicide information on a bag of coffee? Because of how stigma works and it makes us feel like we can't talk about the real stuff. And we were like, why not? And Dark Matter was like, why not? So we did it. And it was on grocery shelves at Whole Foods and other uh, grocery retailers, benefiting the work that we do, yeah. lowering the cost barrier of doing outreach and education, uh, making it so we can just say yes to communities and bring that education to them. Um, since that was successful over a span of about three years, Johnny, the founder of Hope for the Day, and Jesse Diaz, the founder of Dark Matter Coffee, sat back down and uh, put their heads together with their other leadership. And uh, it was like, can we make Sip of Hope Coffee Bar a real thing? Now, Dark Matter has six, maybe more, wonderful, unique individual cafes throughout the city. Um, they know how to run a coffee shop, and they know how to do it well. They also know how to have a social impact with the units that they're moving rather than just making it about price point, right? Mm. So not only do they support us through a lot of their coffee sales, they support a lot of other community initiatives, other social impact uh, endeavors, and even their farmers, um, which is amazing. Wow. Uh, they visit the farms. They're just a socially conscious company, and um, they set a great example. Okay. Anyway, they said, yeah, why, why wouldn't we try this? And they gave it their blessing. So this is not an officially a dark matter coffee shop. It is the first of its kind. It's the world's first ever coffee shop that 100% of the profits go to supporting our work in proactive suicide prevention, mental health education, and outreach. Um, and we sell a bunch of dark matter, including the the mainstay, the, the house brand, the Sip of Hope coffee. But we also have a, a bunch of different dark matter blends that we sell also to support the work we're doing. We also carry Westtown Bakery Pastries just like uh, a bunch of the cafes do. And so you can know if you're coming in here for a sweet tooth or just a little caffeine pick-me-up or you want an herbal tea, you're supporting the work we're doing. You're supporting making our community stronger and lessening the stigmas that exist in certain community spaces. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's a big, long story distilled into maybe just a few minutes, um, but I, I don't want to talk your ear off there on that. So. <laughs> no. It covers well, a lot of ground, it. right? Yeah, yeah no, yeah. It's, it's good information. Yeah. 
So I'm, I'm interested to hear. It sounds it's. So you're saying that Johnny started it by just kind of hop, hopping up on stage and saying, "Hey, it's yeah. okay to not be okay." Little wow. five so minute many. speeches where he got people riled up because they're getting ready for a rock show, but he's cool. also saying things that people needed to hear and were like thirsty to talk about. You know? Yeah. So yeah. it's interesting. I found that. When when the space is open, people do want to talk about it, right? It's yeah. just that we it's taboo, so we don't talk about it. But yeah. once it's open, well, yeah. But you, you get people who are like you said, they're kind of they're jazz to see jazz or something else, right? And uh, they're open. They're open for what's going to come up next on the stage. Yeah, mm-hmm. communal situation. So it opens that platform for uh, an audience. I think it's a really, it's a really yeah. brilliant way to do it. It is. Well, it was so punk rock in the beginning because That's, it was a yeah. lot of younger people just feeling isolated by the fact they look at look at the norms or the status quo of society, the pressures to fit in a box or fit in a slot. Well, they're palpable when you're a punk kid that, you know, wants to wear a leather jacket and have a mohawk or, you know, like wants to get tatted up or just doesn't want to subscribe to traditional values that we hold to be like this normal that doesn't exist. Right. I mean, right. this is setting on a washing machine, as Carl Evans has a tendency to say, which always gives me a point to chuckle, but also <laughs> remind myself, yeah, when I'm like worried about being perceived as normal, what, what am I doing? Like, why, why am I why am I being beholden to generations of stigma that came before me when I know what it is and yeah. I know how we can move behind, beyond it and uh, that's part of what the education is yeah. is sharing that that I also don't have the answers and I have bad days too you know right, right. So. yeah that's, it's very punk rock in and of itself yeah to, to jump on the stage and say hey it's okay to not be okay right like that's, yeah no. yeah well, counter, right? It's also yeah. a conversation starter, right? So you're sure. starting conversations. What better place to have a conversation than a cafe? Oh, 100%. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it's back and forth. Back and forth. Um, I'm curious. Like, I know this. I, I assume that the cafe is doing really well. Yeah, so this is coming up in May will be our two-year anniversary, and there will be some cool stuff happening uh, with community partners and whatnot. Last year for our one-year celebration, um, because I think for a lot of businesses, that first year is like you're white-knuckling it the whole yeah. time. Oh, is yeah, this yeah, going to yeah. work? Are we going to survive? Uh, business is hard, you know, um, especially when you're doing something a little different. But we had such an amazing outpouring of support from this community, Logan Square, Um from people that have lived here a long time, from people that have just moved here, from the library across the street. They give us a home for doing one free education workshop a month, oh. bare minimum. Nice. This also gives us a home to do one live mental health podcast recording a month in the shop um, for Conversations Cafe. It There's just so many opportunities that have come from it. And what's so cool is that first anniversary you had regulars coming in bringing cakes to the staff or pizza or, oh, you know, wow. just like little tokens to just let the baristas know how much this place means to them. Because at the end of the day, the baristas here and the GM here, they're hope for the day staff, but they take on a whole different public facing role being baristas that are trained in mental health first aid and being there to have like some difficult conversations with a person that comes in here knowing what we're about or a person that wanders in here and sees what we're about and maybe uh, becomes emotional and needs to talk about that. Um, It takes a lot of resiliency on their part and a lot of compassion and, um, you know, just careful self-care for them too, you know. Um, But it's just so cool to see people come out and appreciate them that way with cakes and pies and all sorts of stuff. And we did interviews uh, with some of the community members that day. Like, we were just kind of guerrilla podcast people. Me and Rick Rick Osowski, he helps us with our digital education and our podcasting. has a great platform of his own called Anthologies of Hope. Um, We just went around and, you know, roving reporter style, talked to people. It was really cool. It was really cool to get those perspectives uh, from the staff and from the community. So um, I assume that we'll be doing something special like that again this year with 
uh, probably some ice cream and affogados and stuff like that where you pour the espresso over the ice cream. Oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. That's actually very good so, coffee and ice cream. Uh, but, yeah, so coming up on two years, doing well, <laughs> well uh, you, you always looking at ways to enhance uh, the things we're doing in our community. So, um, Do you plan on, like, just staying here at this base or... Uh, with the success of this particular cafe, do you plan on, on having another one opened in another part of the city? Or So uh, since we opened, people have been asking about how do I get one of these in my community. And for that first year, it was more just making this one go, right? And um, But still thinking, yeah, how would we do that? How would we do that where we also... Uh, really maintain the integrity of the spirit of this thing, right? If it's in a different location. Um, so there's been like a bunch of stuff discussed over the year and a half that has been open. So it seems like there will be additional uh, places like this that follow the same model. Um, I just don't have any of that, that kind of information in a clear way. And probably wouldn't be allowed to talk about it if I did. Yeah. Um, yeah. But man... If I, could, if I could tell you how many times people ask, how can I do this? Uh, but usually I can give them the answer that it doesn't have to be just this. to be a community space that says, hey, it's okay not to be okay. You can come here and access some resources because how stigma works, you might not go to the health center. So that's when you get the community members that have businesses that they like connecting us. And then the business reaches out and goes, hey, can I get some resource cards just to keep up by a register? You know, it's almost like putting um, one of those posters up that hate has no home here. You know, Um, like really letting people know in your community that this space exists as more than a business, but as a as a community spot where people can feel welcomed and maybe have a reprieve from all the stigma that exists out in the real world um, and how how much pressure it can create for an individual, especially if they have it coming from all sides, their family, their workplace, um, you know, any a number of things can uh, really make it extra difficult and you really never know what someone's intersection they're coming from is because... We all get very good at wearing that mask and telling people we're fine, uh, and then getting home at the end of the day just exhausted yeah. from pretending yeah. and wanting to just sleep and not talk to anybody about things. Um, that that only exacerbates pressure, right? So yeah. um, exactly. So I'm interested because uh, you said that the community really supported the coffee shop, and uh, so and people come in. I'm assuming some people come in just because they're not feeling okay. Yeah. And so is there training for the, the staff? Yeah, so th- that's a great question. I can talk about that a little more. Um, so not only do they get all the hope for the day, education, which is peer-led and clinically backed, and we put it under the bannerhead of peervention. That's peer-to-peer proactive suicide prevention and mental health education. So that's a mouthful, so we just squash it. Peervention.org right. is where you can find our Eventbrite page and uh, a, a listing of all of the upcoming public education that's free. Um, So essentially, they get that. But on top of that, we wanted to also make sure that there is some crisis response uh, bolstered education in there. So traditional education programs within the suicide prevention space do have a heavier hand on crisis response, right? Ours is not meant to recreate that. It's meant to supplement, right? About the proactive end of it. But the National Council for Behavioral Health, they have an eight-hour certification program called Mental Health First Aid. So when people get hired at Sip of Hope, they get the whole dark matter rundown of how to make an exquisite coffee drink and how to do it the dark matter way because it's different than Starbucks. It's different than other uh, coffee places um, in many ways. Um, but then they also get the Mental Health First Aid uh, certification so that they... They understand about, uh, hey, these are things to be aware of and how to navigate maybe a situation that requires de-escalation, but most importantly, identifying situations that aren't like a sprain injury where self-care is going to help them. Right. It's more like a broken bone where we got to call 911 or get them to professionals, right? Uh, and understanding the signs and symptoms of those situations is not just as easy as learning a list of signs and sy- symptoms. It's more about understanding the nuances, 
of our human behavior and the attitudes that shape our responses to our own mental health and can make it very, very difficult to unpack what's going on with an individual, but asking open-ended questions, being a supportive listener, an active listener, as they say in the teaching world, right? Uh, And knowing that the difference between a what question and a why question can be like pretty critical in a situation. If you ask why, you might be making them feel like they have to justify the feeling. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Asking yeah. what, they can maybe describe it more like as an observation yeah. um, without feeling like they have to justify the feeling. Um, these little deliberate changes in language, you probably got, you've probably you heard me say completed suicide probably towards the beginning of the program. We deliberately say that or died by suicide because it just gives the person more dignity. And it doesn't focus on the way they ended, but it respects all the amazing stuff that their life held, right? Yeah. Uh, and how messy and sticky life can get. So we should always respect the dignity of the individual because um, many times we really judge mental health experiences on a hierarchy. Like uh, It creates a monolith in our society where if you're struggling, if you're experiencing a mental health challenge, you are more likely to conceal it from people that really care about you and likely, likely will understand because you think it's going to reflect on you uh, as some some reflection of your lack of strength or willpower or even your basic competency as a human. Um, well, even even the idea of committing suicide puts it into the realm of crime. Right. Committed crimes, right. committed suicide. Yeah. Killed themselves, well, murderers yeah. kill. Blame. Right? Yeah, blame, and it yeah, puts a blame, blame yeah. rather than respecting that it's a medical experience and not to, you know, discount any physical maladies, but it's equal pain in many ways but there's no pain olympics the pain olympics or the hierarchy of judging people's experiences as more serious versus less serious has been problematic at best over the ages right yeah it's created that situation where we silence ourselves and go oh well i'm feeling this way and it's really affecting my quality of life right now but it's not as bad as that person and then we are like "Ah, i'm just gonna shut up about it right and those things get heavy the more you carry them around all by yourself talking about them helps us to kind of relieve that pressure um, that occurs when we're just trying to deal with it all on our own. Um, So we try to encourage people to be aware of the hierarchy that stigma creates and shapes our responses and try to move beyond it. Respect that it's a visibility spectrum, that trauma or what can be traumatizing to an individual exists on a visibility spectrum in which there are more visible things that, as a community, frankly, we understand and appreciate a little more. Like when people are, you know, subject to violence or abuse and things like that, we're like, oh yeah, I can see that impact, right? Mm-hmm. But invisible stuff, when people are experiencing thoughts, feelings, and emotions, despair, isolation, loneliness, anxiety, a lot of times we've been just conditioned to be like, oh come on, cheer up, it's not that bad, get over it, right. suck it up, yeah where we're well-intended and we're compassionate in which we want to help and we want to fix it, but it ends up dismissing and minimizing a lot of people's experiences where they're like, well, that person doesn't get it. That's the last time I talked to them about it. Right. And you lose that opportunity to uh, be like, hey, I don't understand what you're going through right now, but I can see it's giving you pain and seeing them, validating them, uh, letting them know that, yeah, that sucks instead of trying to fix it, you know? Um, that takes conversation and talking openly and honestly about it. Otherwise, people are not willing to get to that point, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And it takes a shift in mindset, right? Like, yeah, it's a sales pitch, man. Yeah. Our education, I got to... I know that it's not going to stick for everybody right right away on that first session and that they might need to hear it a couple times before... Sure. Well, do you have people coming back in? Or do yeah. Do the staff talks about people who come in and they kind of, they kind of, you know... I mean, we have people that come in here regularly. We have people that go to the workshops, like, to just get another rep at it, get get it, like, kind of deeper into their consciousness because they know it's something that they want to live and breathe. But overcoming a lifetime of learned behavior, as you guys know, oh, yeah. can take some real discipline, you know, and it can take some trial and error you know and uh i still have the days where i am beating myself up about the fact that i don't feel like myself Mm -hmm. uh and 
looking at the wristband helps on those days, but sometimes the voices or the ideas and attitudes within me are much louder than all the love surrounding me. I'm really lucky. I got a lot of people in my support network that are like, I love you. If you need anything. But you know how it can be if you're in that dark negative spiral where it's very hard to hear those voices. Yeah, so. yeah absolutely. Well, you, you obviously you're the director of education for uh, Hope for the Day. But Mike, um, your background, is it in education initially? Yeah. Uh, so I got very, very jaded about being an educator, uh, quite frankly. Um, when I was younger, I struggled, um, but I was able to fly under the radar because I had decent grades and I was connected to some social activities, um, you know, and I had a pretty supportive family and I was lucky enough to have opportunities for higher education. So anytime that I did struggle, you could kind of chart it up to the fact that I was an adolescent and going through puberty, puberty. And when I was in college, you could chalk it up to, hey, he's in college, he's partying, he's whatever. And then, you know, you have a real job. You're working as an educator in the public school system in Chicago. You are kind of in a place where everybody's like, oh, you got it now. You got your apartment. You got your job. You're all set. We don't got to worry about you anymore, right? And uh, so special education, as some people are aware, can be a very, very high burnout track for a career. But I wanted to do something that helped people, especially younger kids that might be struggling. So as a a teacher, a special ed teacher in CPS, uh, I really took every opportunity to talk about our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings. Because a lot of these kids were having behavioral uh, you know, impacts to their learning experience because they were pissed off and frustrated and felt like they sucked at everything, yeah. right? Because they weren't achieving at grade level like their peers, so they felt isolated. So I knew that by talking about mental health, it would help these kids be able to at least improve on their independent functioning within the classroom, uh, improve on their socialization because I knew these school these tools were going to serve them the most as they grew up and became an adult in a world that often doesn't understand learning disabilities, physical disabilities, or emotional disabilities. Right. So the the times that I maybe would get on my soapbox would sometimes you know result in hey you got to do this this way. Uh, one in which was during standardized testing. And with standardized testing, they don't like when you fuck with that. They, that's why it's called standardized testing. But I was, I was furious about the waste of time for these kids and the amount of stress it was putting on my kids that already, already found school to be a stressful environment. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm outspoken, but I also know how to draw that line with your professional responsibilities and not get fired, right? But all that stress of not being enough for all these kids, being asked what would help. Oh, I need more people. I need you to hire more TAs. Oh, we can't do that budget. Right. You should join the union, Mr. V. And I'd be like, I'm in the union. Thank you very much. But I did not get into education to be a politician. I want to help the kids in practical ways. So eventually I just got very frustrated with that. All the while, we experienced a pretty uh, significant high-profile suicide in my, in my school community. Uh, one of the parents um, was a chef, and people knew him, and he was always there. Um, and just res- with respect to his family, I don't have to go into the details, but I knew that if our community as a school was going to support that family and the people that were closely connected to that family that hey I volunteer with Hope for the Day you should have them come in Mm. and have an assembly or at least visit classrooms to help with this community in grief and I was told that I should you know chill out you know like we're not going to talk to this family or address this situation we're not going to do that because it's inappropriate because that's a traditional approach is we need to respect the family during this tough time but it also sends a conflicting message that we're not going to acknowledge that there's pain in life, yeah. that there are difficult situations that impact not only one family but the whole community, and that by rather speaking openly about that, you offer a compassionate approach 
as a community where people don't feel like they're all alone going through that grief. Um, so that was like the straw for me, you know. So I've just started to kind of reevaluate how I could continue to be an educator but do it in a way that I still felt was impactful and could be proud of. And uh, Johnny and me had been friends since he came and spoke at a career day at uh, an alternative high school program that I worked at uh, way back in the beginning of me living in Chicago again. And, man, he dealt with kids that were trying to push my buttons every day with such grace, and he invited them to the conversation and made them feel heard. They were angels with him. These kids typically we're not angels with guests in our community so that was when I first started getting involved and he was always teasing me when I got into CPS he's like you ever leave CPS to come work for Hope of the Day and like I was like yeah I love that man but come on like I gotta eat but eventually uh, there was a grant opportunity um, to take Beat Keepers a program that I've been doing where we make beats uh, we don't keep beats. A lot of people mishear that, but we make beats on a computer. So uh, I like to take my musical passion, because I'm a musician, somewhat professionally uh, in my free time to keep me healthy. It's a really important part of my self-care um, and self-expression, because I love to write songs and stuff like that and make stuff with my friends. Um, essentially taking my skills and passion for music and producing... Pairing it with my education experience and my desire to talk about uh, social and emotional literacy for youth, we, create, we, we were able to take this program into uh, a place called Lawrence Hall. It's on the north side. They do a lot of uh, residential treatment as well as they've got a therapeutic day school. Um, this was an opportunity for me to come work for Hope for the Day. It wasn't a huge opportunity that was going to pay all my bills, but I saw it as an opportunity nonetheless to take a leap of faith and create a job that uh, kind of seemed like something I was willing into existence over uh, the course of a couple years. Um, and it wasn't easy. I, I did Beat Keepers programming at Lawrence Hall with a lot of different youth there that have been taken away from their biological families for a lot of really, really tough reasons. Um, so they're, they're youth in care, pre- previously referred to as wards of the state. So the guardian's office is their guardian. Um, And it was so powerful to work with those kids and see them see that they could make music even if they hadn't learned an instrument or had the opportunity to learn an instrument using little bits of music on GarageBand. And then to also trick them into working together in like productive ways so that they could practice job skills, life skills in a way that wasn't, you know, restricted to academia. It was very real. And um, these kids uh, really got a lot out of it. And I was walking dogs, playing as many cover gigs as I could, waking up at 5 a.m. to drive a lift because this opportunity meant so much to me. And I understood that the nonprofit would be growing to a place where I could make this a career, but that it wasn't there yet. And then like a year later, um, I I got put on salary and I started to be able to kind of have to relearn saying no to certain opportunities. Like... People be calling me up, be like, hey, can you jump out of a bush at Millennium Park to, for this person's proposal and learn this Jack Johnson song by 3 p.m. today? I'd be like, 250 bucks? Sure, sure, I'd do that. Um, but then understanding I didn't have to say yes to like really random gigs like that anymore um, and really focus on this is my, my new path. And uh, so now I'm three years in and uh, things have come to a place where, yeah, I got to say no a lot to opportunities that I otherwise would have said yes to, but it's because I'm doing a bunch of really neat things that I never thought would be the reality of my professional life. Um, Went to a new school in CPS today to talk to their seventh graders, going back on Monday and Tuesday to talk to their sixth and eighth graders. Uh, The day before that, I was out in the suburbs, kind of near Naperville, at a middle school talking to their health classes. And... I got to talk to kids at Columbia College last week, and as well as a workforce development program downtown where they work with adults that have been homeless or impoverished or marginalized in some way that are just trying to get on their feet and get jobs. I did that at same education with those people that are client-facing, their HR, their back office. Um, I've done it in concert venues. I've done it in bars and restaurants. 
I've done it with chefs, and I've even done it in correctional facilities. So I'm like, wow, I get to travel every once in a while and be able to meet people where they're at, and not just my community, because I live about a mile from the shop, but like in a bunch of other places. And uh, now in 2020, one of my big goals is to empower more voices and make our education, our peer-led education more representative. I'm a white guy. I'm a white straight guy, right? I want to empower some voices of color or, you know, immigrants or gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans individuals that really can speak on this in, uh, in powerful ways as well. Um, so, so our education is kind of taking on that next evolution where we're trying to empower our agents of impact, which is what we call our volunteers. That if, one, if some of you want to be able to raise up your voice to a level of bringing our education into communities that you are passionate about impacting, Get us up. Hit us up. I'm, I'm Mike at HFTD.org, and I'd be happy to uh, utilize any people power to extend our impact into more communities because um, that's that's how we continue to make this grow in a sustainable, powerful way that can change communities and how they respond to mental health. So, so you've talked about doing workshops at the library across the street. You've talked about... Uh, talking to school age children. Uh-huh. You've talked about meeting with a lot of different people. Can you tell us in a little more detail what the, those educational opportunities sure. are, like the different options? For sure. So, for um, as far as our peer prevention curriculum, we have we have a one hour that we do most often called Things We Don't Say. It's a one hour workshop. Um, it's really focused on understanding what stigma does. And it gives people an opportunity to join that conversation and share what stigma means to them from whatever intersection they happen to be coming from. And then the latter half of the one-hour education is understanding, yeah, we can talk about stigma for a whole week, but let's try and move beyond it and give you some language and tools to reframe your own understanding and perspective about what mental health is for our community and how it impacts all of our quality of life, right? So we use this soda bottle analogy during that portion of the conversation to give people an informal conversational tool that's inclusive. It doesn't box anybody out. It doesn't misappropriately assign a diagnosis to a person and whatever challenge they're experiencing. Um, And it gives you like kind of some approachable language to talk to somebody that's little or somebody that's elderly that's really set in their ways or somewhere in between. as a way to contextualize the impact. So the soda bottle analogy goes like this. Imagine your mind's a, a bottle of soda and that all aspects of your life can shake that bottle up and build pressure. Self-expression is how we release the pressure without exploding. That exploding point where you imagine shaking up a bottle, popping the top, maybe even throwing a Mentos in there where you get that geyser. Yeah. That explosion point is what we want to use to conceptualize the crisis stage that we're aiming to disrupt arriving right we want to disrupt escalation by being able to respond in more real time to mental challenges that are maybe smaller rather than concealing and waiting to that crisis point Mm -hmm. so if we think about that and that all of our individual experiences and the pressure they're creating for us well our job to take the best possible care of us is to be aware of our pressure to be aware when it's getting to a critical mass where we feel like we're ex- exploding and maybe pain's leaking out a little bit. We're snapping off on our mom or our best friend or our spouse because we're just feeling a little raw and uh, not in control of our emotions. Well, that pressure, when it's filling up that bottle, clouds our judgment. It makes it hard to think as we normally would. But expressing ourselves and utilizing different tools and strategies for healing and management allows us to release pressure, even take the cap off sometimes, right? Um, And being able to understand that when the things that we normally use to valve out that pressure aren't working, that, that doesn't mean that we should be ashamed. That just means that the pressure we're dealing with is overwhelming the tools we have and that we might have to up it to a professional level of support or at least talk to somebody about building that bridge to having that conversation about your mental health like because no one should have to suffer your quality of life should be the best that it possibly can for you someone with diabetes doesn't just say oh shit i'm gonna lose a leg to neuropathy 
they adapt, hopefully, different strategies and disciplines, be it a diet or an insulin regimen, to address that one of their organs isn't operating properly. Their pancreas isn't producing the right amount of insulin. Too much, too little, the wrong amounts at the wrong times, and then that's impacting their ability for their body to turn the food into usable sugar for energy. Right. And hey, I'm going to manage that. I've got a name for it. I'm going to learn about it. I'm going to try and be as proactive as I can to limit the disruption to my physical health. Well, when it comes to a mental health impact, it might not ever qualify as a diagnosis, but the chemicals produced in your brain can be all out of whack due to an emotionally intensive experience that you've had, something that's built up gradually over time or something that's happened suddenly. And the simple fact of the matter is is that that medical experience might require additional supports at a professional level sometimes when you are experiencing pressures that are unimaginable. Um, That's often why people will result in having chemical dependencies when we talk about self-harming behaviors like using substances and alcohol, right? We don't try to judge that. We try to understand that some people with the total absence of education and the total absence of spaces to talk openly about your mental health, they're desperate to feel better or feel nothing at all. So they'll they'll turn to the bottle or they'll turn to some pretty heavy drugs or even cutting or other types of self-harming behaviors, right? Calorie restriction, binge eating, all sorts of things that can ultimately result in, in a clinical diagnosis, but nor should they have to to be able to receive support and be able to overcome whatever you're dealing with it if it's just a mental health challenge that uh, you don't have language for, right? So um, that soda bottle analogy allows us to talk about pressures, valves, and what you do when you can't relieve that pressure all on your own um, so that people can normalize that conversation no matter where they're at. Well, you're giving them a narrative with which to frame their problem. And yeah. It's a universal kind of narrative for mental health, or stress issues, depression issues. Uh, and I think largely what people come into psychotherapy for, or psychologists for, or counselors, social workers, they're looking for a way to rewrite the narrative so it's not a zero-sum game with I have to avoid thinking or feeling this way and they're able to take those feelings and give expression to them and, and create a narrative articulate and, and, them and yeah. connect it lay down like if you will neural pathways in that narrative so they're not splitting a part of themselves off but that's also part of them and then that part can heal if you will right and that's that CBT part that cognitive behavioral therapy component that has such a widely supported research base but Communities that don't talk about mental health, you say CBT, they don't know what the fuck you're talking right. about. Right. They don't know what therapy is like. They they have some ideas yeah. from TVs yeah, and yeah. movies, but like we almost have to start at therapy 101. Right. There's also the so stigma. people can understand that yeah, it's a, it's a it's a doctor. Well, yeah. you know, ster- largely what you do in therapy is just you literally do what you're doing. It's a lot of psychoeducation. Yeah. There's other things you mentioned, tricking kids into being socially connected. Yeah. I mean, there are there there are kind of sleight of mouth or ways to work with with with, with clients to to get them to do things they might not do. Yeah, build or up just those protective factors. Repetition right? yeah. over the weeks, and you know, like I'm happy if somebody gets better and they just don't come back in, right. or they don't know why they're getting better, but they know they're coming in and it's working. Yeah, some and, people can graduate yeah. treatment, right? Yeah. And some people, well, they might be living with an illness that it requires consistent checking in with a professional. Correct. That's kind of how it is with me. I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder when I was 31. So So I was like... You did a good job up until then. I was like, oh, man. I understand what was going on when I was 15, 16, 17. Because now I have language for it. And I've read a book. And I've gone to a professional that actually... uh, worked with me on holding myself accountable to certain things I had to do to take better care of myself and to take control of the fact that I live with an extra layer to this whole equation. Yeah. Not everybody's going to live with mental illness, um, but I like to at least be open about it so I could take what was kind of a, a negative experience in the moment 
ultimately became something positive because my family had to address the fact that this isn't uncommon for our family okay. and it's not uncommon for the community at large. Yeah. So now I've got a bunch of advocates in my family uh, trying to think about this stuff differently too. Um, Opened up a larger conversation. Yeah, it sure did. Yeah. It sure did. And I see a therapist that really helps me. And, and, and if I get to a point where I don't have anything to talk about, which has happened in the past where I've been seeing a, a therapist, um, then I'll take a break. But at no point am I going to be like trying to think of it in the way I used to where like, oh, therapy is only for people that are crazy or like having a major disruption in their life. Yeah. It's not different than a dentist who works on your teeth. It's not different than a general doctor doing your physical health checkup and checking your blood work. If you want to be as proactive as possible, there's no shame in checking out a professional level uh, of care for mental health. And it, it's, it doesn't have to be a doctor. It can be just a counselor or, a, you know, an LCPC. You know, there's a lot of different tiers to that. And I think the most kind of scary thing for a lot of people is they're like, I'm not going to be able to find one that works right away. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes that's the case. It's true. You're a consumer of a service, and if you went to a doctor or a dentist that gave you like a weird vibe and you weren't clicking, you'd probably go to a different one. So you got to be able to do that with the therapist too. But there's certain health access structural components that make that conversation an extra big nightmare, depending on where you're coming from and uh, what resources you have. So that's why we are real heavy on that portion of the conversation when it pertains to valving and how we deal with our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings to achieve healing when we need it and manage when we need it. Well, we want to talk about that in re reference to a spectrum too because there's healthy things we all do that those, those opportunities within the conversation in our workshops, most often people raise their hand and say, I work out, I take a bath. I pet my dog. I talk to my mom. I go to therapy. People will say a lot of the things that are on that healthy end of the spectrum. But occasionally people will do it for me. They'll raise their hand up and they'll be like, I have a drink. I smoke a joint. I, uh, I sometimes just get really pissed off and go off on somebody that I love, you know? But sometimes I got to bring it back and be like, hey, let's be honest. Let's normalize this conversation. Let's talk about the fact that some people use substances. Yeah. Some people engage in things that can be really like self-sabotaging. And um, that's a really important part of the conversation, too. So we destigmatize like what they call non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, right? Um, or addiction type behavior where that's like often even more stigmatized for individuals that are just desperate to feel a little bit better because um, that's a whole other ball of wax and uh, just having a little grace and you know remember that it's a person and that they're probably coming coming from a place of intense pain um, will help us to address opioid academics on down the line to uh, people using prescriptions without pairing it with therapy because yeah. I mean that's a band-aid in my opinion you know like, well, we like to hear that. Yeah. Yes. As, <laughs> I agree. As, as nine uh, prescribers ourselves. But also, uh, yes, uh, everything seems to work better. The efficacy of drugs is much better, uh, or the treatment in general, if it's a combination, yeah. integrated treatment. Right, yeah. And I, and I think, like, we're proactive with prevention in that we don't want to get a cold, right? So we take vitamins. We take supplements. We try to have an appropriate amount of sleep, exercise, and nutrition. Well, if your individual circumstance requires a little assistance, calm your vitamins and minerals if you're feeling stigmatized about taking medication. But just like somebody that's got high blood pressure, do what's best for your individual situation to have the highest quality of life possible. But for God's sakes, if you're, if you're using medication to support your mental health, also do the work and be willing to uh, give yourself the best possible chance to overcome what can be very challenging to overcome, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even if you're just going through a transition in your life or an adjustment some, mm -hmm. somehow, having someone to talk to about that where it's not going to go anywhere is, is yeah. a huge benefit. Right Confidentiality now. can be hard to come by when people want to, you know, share your business and stuff like that. So 
therapy has been helpful for me because then I also have somebody that's as objective as they can be yeah. about the situations that are stressing me the hell out and gives me that perspective and gives me some like, you know, pretty tangible feedback that I can either act upon or just maybe consider. And all of that's helpful to me. Um, I just, I guess I didn't understand what therapy would be like until I tried it and how you don't just talk and they fix you. You have to be able to put in the work and cater your experience like to you as an individual and ask them to hold you accountable for certain things that you're struggling with. Like for me, my therapist is, she's really interesting because sometimes I'll be talking, 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 talking. She, She's listening really well, and then when I get done, she goes, sounds like you do a lot of stuff for other people, like kind of like <laughs> side-eyeing me. <laughs> because I've asked her to hold me accountable for the fact that sometimes I keep a very busy schedule because I'm just trying to outrun my anxiety at all times. Yeah. And it was a learned behavior. But then I'm getting better at sitting with it when things are slower and I have the time for my thoughts to catch up, and that's, that's something I need to learn to manage better all the time and I'm constantly trying to refine so when she says stuff like that I'm like yeah you're right I need to maybe after this appointment go do something for me and maybe not be attached to my phone or my computer you know because that's just kind of the reality of uh, of the world in many ways when people are just trying to constantly hustle and uh, you know grab these opportunities but man that that's not a, a good way to avoid burnout. Well, I mean, I think just uh, <laughs> yeah, it just as it's okay not to be okay, it's okay not to be constantly engaged, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like you have to take time for yourself, and I'm learning that um, that the discomfort that I used to feel when I'm when I'm sitting there convalescing and trying to like just slow down and take some time for me, um, it's not as uncomfortable because I'm strengthening. My resiliency. I'm strengthening my ability to manage those feelings and have a name for them and be like, hey, I'm not going to listen to you today. And some days I I can't do that. I can't find that motivation to fight back uh, in the way that I do on other days. And I'll flip my bracelet so it faces me, you know? Sometimes um, I'll I'll wear a couple, you know? And passing them out and talking to people... um, there's you can also see. power in the yeah. choice, though, right? Like yeah. you, you're, you sound like you're aware of it. Yeah. So if you say today, I'm going to let my anxiety run the show. I'm going to, I'm going to outrun it today. Tomorrow, I'm going to step back on and do it again. Right? There's power in making that choice for, for sure. yourself in a conscious way. Yeah. Right. Or instead of it, you know, like kind of controlling you. Right. Um, but that. That's a that's a real real long road for a lot of us, and yes. it's a continuous road that's non-linear, right? Yeah. I got hiccups and bumps in the road still, um, but I'm really lucky that I understand what works for me a little bit better, um, and I have a load a loaded up toolbox. Um, but I still understand that some days when I tried the things that normally work, and I'm just stuck. Um, Talking is one of those things that can really get me out of it. Even if no one's around, I can talk to myself. I can write in my notebook and do an old-fashioned stream of consciousness brain dump and see what's there. Just get it out, you know, because otherwise I get these racing thoughts that uh, make it hard to focus on anything else that might get me out of that, like, uh, that cycle I'm in. So, um, but that's like a lot of learning, you know. It's like the difference between working on a business or a business the difference between working on yourself or in yourself. If sure, you're sure, yourself, I like that. Sometimes you're uh, just too absorbed in what can get to be a whirlwind of mental activity. Yeah. Yeah, you got to take that brain up to look at it so you can work on it. Yeah, definitely. And I'm so lucky to have a supportive partner. Uh, we're getting married at the end of September, but she works here as a sipperista, so it's like the family Congrats. business. I'm over at the office. She's here. Congrats. Um, thank you. And she, uh, you know, she has her own lived experience story and will listen to me and try to understand where I'm coming from when I'm like clearly not myself and I'm not okay. And, uh, you know, we try to just give each other those space, spaces to, you know, be open about it. Like I've learned a lot from her about how to support her, right? A lot of times I'd come home and I'd be like, oh no, I can tell that she's feeling the blues right now. I'm going to make a million suggestions of how to fix that. 
and when that's not necessarily what she needs and she's right. been able to kind of be comfortable enough to share with me that hey that doesn't I know you're trying to help but that's not helpful right. and I need you to just sit with me and maybe just say yeah that sucks and I don't need you to be more fancy than that and I'm like oh okay I'm gonna try that <laughs> can you can you like give me a little you know, can, can, yeah, can you give me a little grace as far as like how long it takes me to improve on my my fixer mentality? Because we all want to fix things. Sure. If we love somebody, a friend, family, neighbor, if we see them hurting, we're like, oh, man, I don't want them to hurt anymore right now. Let me see how I can fix it. Right. Rather than sometimes letting people feel their feelings is the best way to let them not be, you know, just dragged down by them um, going forward, uh, giving them the chance to let it out into the air and yeah. let it become everyone's, not just theirs, you know? Yeah, that's so. powerful. So is there, are there anything, what's coming up? Oh yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, I don't know if this will be relevant by the time that this airs, but um, we have a podcast each month called Conversations Cafe this coming Thursday, which is February 13th. We're doing an episode entitled Me, Myself, and I. It's focusing on self-love. It's focusing on validation of experiences. Uh, when you have a lot of Valentine's Day shit thrown in your face this time of year, we try to uh, <laughs> we try to focus in on that for um, our February episode each year. Um, and so you can listen to those past podcasts uh, at Anthologies of Hope on whatever streaming platform you use. Um, and also Ox Podcast Network is a, is a collective of Chicago podcasts. Um, you guys should hit them up. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, essentially, if you're not able to make it this month for that podcast, we're doing it again in March. And you can always check in at peervention.org. That's P-E-E-R-V-E-N-T-I-O-N.org. It's so hard to verbally spell sometimes, <laughs> but it's peervention.org. Uh, and then you can sign up for a uh, free RSVP or just walk in. This uh, It's always a great opportunity for inviting the conversation to the community or inviting the co- community to the conversation about different intersections. Um, and then this month for February, our workshop is on Saturday, February 22nd from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's our four-hour workshop. It's a deeper dive than the one-hour workshop that we do most often in the community. Um a lot of times people don't have four hours, and they'll come for a portion of it um, and get a lot out of it, but um, it's a really, really great opportunity to kind of not rush through the subject matter of stigma and proactive prevention vocabulary and strategies. Um, it also allows the opportunity to talk a little bit more about crisis response so that it's a, a more fleshed out uh you know, full spectrum of how we can respond better to mental health in our communities. Um, That is also in March, every Saturday, or it's one Saturday a month. So the Saturday in March uh, is Saturday, March 28th. Um, I do know that date offhand. So again, if you're ever wondering, you can check Hope for the Day Facebook events tab or our Eventbrite page, which is uh, redirected at peervention.org. Um, and as far as the cafe, if somebody out in the audience is like really excited about yeah. volunteering or, or working here as a barista at Sip of Hope, how would they go about doing that? So every day we're open from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, the address is 3039 West Fullerton Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. Um, you can come in and if you want to volunteer with Hope for the day, you can even just go on your on your phone, on your laptop, whatever. Go to HFTD. That's Henry, Thomas, uh, Freddie, David. Hope for the day. dot org will get you there too. HFTD. dot org. Um, there's a Chicago area volunteer form that you could submit if you'd like to be included on those volunteer email blasts. Uh, lots of cool opportunities to uh, just be there to have a conversation and raise the visibility of resources in the community. Um, we do concerts, like I said. We do health fairs. We do art events, all sorts of stuff. So um, feel free to get involved that way through the Agents of Impact program. That's if you're an individual. Uh, if you're a business or an organization that wants to get involved, check out the Partners in Prevention program on the website. The baristas here can give you lots of information about the organization, uh, but chances are they'll redirect you up 
to a, to a department head uh, of some sort. So I can be reached out to for education uh, questions and stuff at mike at hftd.org. And uh, happy to happy to chat. Ask me anything. If I don't know the answer to something, I'll let you know that I'm going to research it with my team and find those answers for you. Um, ultimately, yeah, we're we're just trying to get as many people involved as possible. If you want to come support us by having a coffee, great. If you want to get more involved, definitely want to hit up us through the website. Um, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Well, Mike Vinopal, thank you so much. Thanks, man. And, and uh, so we'd love great to have you on. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm so glad to have you guys, and we'll uh, we'll try and find a way to get you guys on as guests on our podcast too, so um, that we can get, keep this love going, keep spreading the message into our individual spheres of influence, because uh, then we'll have more people, right? Yeah, yeah. sounds great. Right. And, and just to be correcting myself, I went for it again. I, I think it's been open. It's been opal. <laughs> I wasn't going to correct you a second time. I don't usually do that because I don't really care if you're. It just, it, 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 if you're just, not calling me an asshole, I don't really care how you. So. All right. Well, thank Always you. Always say so I've been much. called worse, right? Yeah. <laughs> thank you guys so right, much. Yeah. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Me too. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Chicago Psychology Podcast. As always, thank you for tuning in. The show is, as always, for informative and educational purposes only and should not be construed as therapy or as a replacement for psychotherapy. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. All material copyright 2020, the Chicago Psychology Podcast. Theme music is provided by the band... Serenati. Mm-hmm.